Hello everybody and welcome to this week's VRTK weekly live stream. Um, I'll give it a couple of minutes just in case anybody else wants to join uh, on the hour of 8 which is when we usually start uh, and then I'll do the usual of going through what's been happening this week in VRTK and then if anyone's got any questions and that we'll also take those afterwards. And as always, feel free in chat to uh, just chat amongst yourselves and say hello and whatever. Um, I'm guessing chat's going to be a bit quiet, so shall we just kick off with what's been going on? Because a fair bit's been going on this week. So let's start off from last week. There were some things that came out of last week's live stream. There's a couple of bugs that I noticed. Um, so they were fixed after last week's live stream. So uh, it now un highlights um, correctly. It wasn't seemed to un, un highlight correctly last week, so that's been fixed. Uh, set the transform of near touch custom collider container. I don't remember what that was. Um, uh, yeah, haptics weren't being reset properly as well. And this was another big issue, so we kind of covered this last week. Um, and I'll show you this now. So last week we had how to get the event. On when the controller was disabled, I just turn my controller on. Um, and if we run the scene, any second now it'll run. My computer is slowly dying. So you get the controller start enabled and in exchange. And last week we were trying to do this with the controller events disabled script, but it wasn't actually firing. Um, you, we were having to hook into the uh, the tracked controller event which this uses anyway and it just it was supposed to bubble it up but it wasn't bubbling up so that's been fixed now hopefully so if I turn my controller off we didn't get the event why are we not getting that event am I on the wrong branch or something I'm pretty sure this is working um, maybe it's still not working do I not have a... Oh, no. It's not going to work in this example scene because of uh, where I've got the this script because it disables this script, doesn't it? So, right. We can get it working. I'll show you what we need to do. It's a script that's broken. It's not uh, the fix for the codes. When, Vi when Visual Studio loads up, I'll show you what I mean. Um, let's close all the other stuff down. So the reason is is because when we uh, disable the controller, because that script is sitting on the controller, it turns it off. So what we need to do is controller events make public just quickly. And then here, if we just create an empty object and put that on this empty object, see this gets disabled. And once it's disabled, that won't be there to throw the event anymore. So all we need to do now is say you use this controller events and then when we run it what am I getting? Oh yeah, of course. Because the left one is still empty. So let me just turn that off on the left one actually. That should be alright. I need to run it on the right one. No, okay, let's just delete it off the left one then. Is it in the away? Why are you moaning then? I don't know. Right, if I delete it, it shouldn't crash, maybe. No, why is it moaning? Uh... Oh, because <laughs> I'm calling get components straight on it here. What I need to do is uh, controller event is not equal null, then use controller. And otherwise we can get it off the object which wouldn't matter anyway right now it'll work even though I keep saying that it keeps breaking so we get our enable state and our index state changed and now when we disable this because this is not on the gam object it's going to get disabled it should still emit the event so if we power it off you can see we get control disabled so if you watched last week's live stream and you saw the whole rigmarole that we had to go through to actually get the controller disabled event, 
Um, you don't need to do that anymore as long as you you're listening for the event on the controller event script, which this is doing, and it's not on the controller because it will get disabled and that will be pointless. So you can just listen to that and you can figure out when a controller is enabled and when it is disabled. So that was done last week. Um, and that was the merge press for that. Uh, a highlighter uses correct aliases. A controller highlighter was not using the correct model alias. Uh, it would also fail if SD came on into a switch. Okay, so that was a fix for the highlighter. Um, remove code that's no longer required. Okay, that was just a couple of warnings that got fixed. Provide custom highlights to interactable objects. Okay, so this one as well um, is a slight change if we just look on here. So previously, the way um, the interactable object itself worked, if you had a highlighter on something, all you had to do was have the highlighter on the game object and it would use that highlighter. Or if you didn't, it would automatically create it. But what you can do now is you can actually have the highlighter on a separate game object. Uh, so if we create one down here, and then we grab this off, this one, nope, this one, and we grab this off and we put it on there. Then if we go back to there, you can say, take the highlighter from this other object by just a, a giving it a custom highlighter from another object, and then it will use one on there. If you wanted to keep your interactable object script clean, and then I've kind of like uh, helper objects that you can inject in and you can build them up at runtime and inject them around and everything like that. So um, that's just something that we're going to start doing more as well with, with this thing where by default the script, if it, need, if it requires a component, it will look in the inject, you'll be able to inject to the component to start with. Um, if it can't find the injected component, it will look on the same game object or potentially its children or its parents um, for that that component. And if it can't find it there, if it's appropriate to do so, it will create um, that component on your behalf for you. So this is kind of like the first way of going down this now. So again, if it doesn't find the injected one, it will look on the, the game object itself. And if it doesn't find that, it will create a default one. Um, and we'll see another commit something uh, similar to that in a moment as well. Uh, ensure valid grab attempt is called. The interact grab script requires is valid grab attempt method. What was this one? To be called to set up state for future calls. This was removed during a cleanup. Oh, that was I just broke something, but I fixed it. I broke the grab, um, but that was broken like a, a commit the day before. So. No one's probably come across that. Um, do, 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 do. Where have I just gone now? I've scrolled down too much. I might ensure value grab. There we go. Uh, prevent unwanted snap. I'm leaving trigger clutter. Okay, that was another fix that I'd broke something. Allow grab to remove from unsnappable joints. That was another, if you'd been using the new snap drop zone stuff um, that had been put in, uh, this fixed some issues with that. So it won't be on the old snap drop zone stuff anyway. Uh, also as well, I'd notice that there were shadows on the snap drop zone highlight objects. So they were cast in shadows, so that's been removed now. because I don't think they should cast shadows. And I shouldn't receive shadows either, so that's been removed. Um, okay, this was another one as well. So uh, somebody asked if... Uh, let's go and have a look. On the, the point of area collision, there was a couple of... No, not that one. This one. There was a couple of issues with this anyway. In that... If you had, um, where is it? We need to put a, a direction indicator on here. Just turn the control on again. No wrong prefabs folder. So we put a direction indicator in here. And then on the right script, we just say uh, renderer as the direction indicator. There we go, direction indicator. So what was the first thing that was happening here was when you rotated this and then released, the play area still hadn't, the cursor hadn't updated. So you can now see when we do release, when we rotate, the cursor is actually at the correct rotation. Oh, I think I've picked up my control with the broken touchpad. Um, it now picks up the correct rotation um, of the play area when you've rotated. So that's uh, one thing. But now also what you can do as well, on the play area cursor, you can also give that a direction indicator as well. And what that does is if you give the player a cursor direction indicator, 
when they're on the scene. Now when you scroll it around, it actually rotates the player ear cursor as well for you. So it shows exactly where you're going to, what your player position is going to be when you release. Um, so hopefully that's useful for some people. Uh, auto correct point render. Okay, so this was the other one I was talking about. So uh, let's go to another example scene to show this off. So previously, you had to, for those who have used the pointers and that, you had to add a VRTK pointer, you had to have the stripe point renderer, and then you had to hook it up to the pointer renderer, you had to do all these things. So this is going to be one of these new ones that if you don't hook one up, it will look on the game object for you. So now if I haven't hooked that up, I've just got them on the same one. It will go, well, you've already got one there, so I'll hook it up. And I'll and I'll make that that one, so that's fine. And if you don't have one at all, um, it'll then do the little bit of magic. And it go, oh, you haven't got anything. Well, you need something, so I'll create a straight one with all the default settings for you. So it still works, even if you just had a VRTK point, you still get a very basic straight point of renderer for you. Um, but obviously, you I would still recommend using it with the injection and stuff. It's just one of these things that makes it very easy. A lot of people come along and they go, oh, I've added a script and it's not working and they can't figure out what's going on. So whilst it's a little bit of magic, uh, the magic is kind of like a fail safe as opposed to standard behaviour. So we'll try this and see how it goes with people. I think it's going to be uh, a nice addition. Um, provide custom highlight to the controller highlighter. So again, as we saw with the interactable object, you can inject the highlighter. You can also do the same for the controller highlighter now. You can inject that in. Um, what else was done? Oh, there was a fix on the, the pointers when you disabled uh, either the pointer script or the pointer renderer script. Um, if you were using like a line renderer or something like that, maybe it wouldn't actually uh, disable the line renderer. Um, or it wouldn't disable the object, so that's been fixed now as well. Um, so that's largely uh, been the week of the ATK. There's nothing in the master branch because it's all going into the release branch now pretty much anyway because it's just new features on top of existing features. There's another branch I've just started uh, where I'm trying to make the, the, the documentation better. Um, so I'll show you how this looks or how it's going to look. I've only done one file at the moment to kind of like uh, prove a concept. Um, will it be... what file was it I changed? Control haptics. Oh, interactable object I think we can look at. So if I just view this, and we look at... Uh, so you'll notice already on the prefabs in the documentation in 3.30 anyway, um, they have a prefab usage section that kind of like describes how to use the prefab. So if we look at uh, interactions, interactable object, oh, was one of the ones updated. Where is it? There it is. You can see now it's a lot more detailed. We've got interactable object, we've got a simple overview. We say what components are required for the interactable object to work and what optional components are required. So we say these are things that are optional that are also needed um, on for this to work. And then we, we provide information on how to use the script as well. So place the interactable object on a game object that you set to the interaction, etc., etc. And so it makes it a lot uh, easier to understand. And if you look at the previous documentation for something like interactable objects, uh, documentation a bit in here, won't Interaction, interactable object. It was just this, which didn't, it was very difficult to understand what to actually do or how to use them. So this new structure will be applied to you know all the scripts so it should be a lot easier to get going and know what to do with the scripts. So that's the plan anyway. Hopefully it'll, it'll be a lot better but documentation is something that we're going to keep evolving and because of the structures that's changed now we can start doing things like getting started guides, tutorials and stuff like that within the documentation so hopefully that will be coming soon as well. Um, that is it. For the changes of uh, VRTK this week, um, I'm trying to think if anything else happened in the week of VRTK. I don't think anything major has happened this week. Um, next week's obviously a, a big thing. It's VRDC in San Francisco next week. I'm doing my talk on VRTK on the 21st. So if you are at VRDC, then uh, come and check out the talk. Uh, we're also doing the VRTK kind of like meetup hangout on the 20th in San Francisco. So if you are from San Francisco and you want to come to that, the plan is we're going to meet up at the Hilton. 
uh, the Union Square Hilton, which is on O'Farrell, um, at about 7 o'clock on the 20th, so 7 p.m. in the evening. Um, we'll meet there in the lobby, and then we'll wait to about half 7, 7.30, and uh, see who else turns up, and then from there we'll figure out where we're going to go, depending on how many people turn up for it. Um, so, yeah, next week's going to be pretty pretty big, I'm expecting, with news. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that's happened. I don't know if anything else important has happened uh, this week in the world of VRTK. Um, I'm not thinking there is. So, after that then, we can throw it open to questions from people watching. So, if anyone has any questions, then please let me know. And we can go through and do them. Does anybody have any questions? There was a question in the Slack channel uh, this week. Somebody was really struggling to be able to use uh, an object with the pointer. And I tried to explain that it was very simple. But I think it was like on a Friday or something and I was busy. Um, so I'm going to do that now while people are coming up with questions. And just show you how easy it is. So these doors here... Basically, you, you don't open them yourself manually. What they were saying, they had doors set up, and they had um, they were porting it over from like a, a desktop game where you clicked on the door with the mouse to open it, and they wanted to be able to point to pointer at it and then press like the trigger on the controller to do that. And they were going down some really convoluted route. You don't need to do any of that stuff because these have got a use action already on them. All you need to do on a controller is give it a pointer. Let's create a pointer. And uh, we'll give it a renderer as well. And then on the interactable object itself, uh, there's just a pointer activates use action. So if we just tick that on, just that there, um, and untick that thing. And no, actually, you might want that ticked on. Um, now, if we, I'd have to be stuck in the door, wouldn't I? Uh, let me just move myself back a bit. Uh, Steam VR, there we go. So if we point at the door, you can see we haven't done any code, but we can just point at it and it opens. I just want to check something quickly. Can we? Um, oh, what's going on here? What is going on? What are you building? Stop building <laughs> stuff. What's going on? Hang on, what's just happened? Using a door. Let's go back to the using a door scene where it hasn't saved any of my stuff. Um, move that forward a bit and put a pointer back on again. Put a straight pointer on and on our door. I want to say contract rights use action. Yes, so I wanted to see what happened. We have to hold button to use up. So if I say hold button to use, okay. So you can't still now you get that that double press issue. Yeah, okay. So you need hold button to use on. Okay, that's fine. So then you can just you just point it out the door. Yeah, that works. So as long as you've got a whole one to use, that works fine. Um, so the next question, anyway, put some dampening on the control to ease handshake, mainly for point. Yes, there is. Uh, you can add smoothing options on a pointer. So um, on the renderer itself, you've got pointer smoothing settings. So you can just say smooth position, smooth rotation. Um, and then you can change these settings to uh, determine how smooth you want it to be. So let's see if we turn this off. And I hold that. You can see there's a bit, there's no smoothing on there. You can see the pointer here, you see the movement of the pointer. That's just like natural variance of my hand. You can see it's kind of like all over the place. And if we turn the smoothing on, just at the default settings, you can see there's a lot less movement now. It's a lot stiller, there's a lot, a lot less shakiness around. And then you can increase these uh, smoothing settings as well if you want. 
I don't know what values work, I don't really use the smoothing settings. Yeah, see the higher you go there, the more smoothed it is. And you can use that on uh, either of the pointers, but you can also smooth any object as well. So the thing that this uses is, is um, uh, what's it called? The, I can't even remember the name of the script now. It's in here somewhere. Uh, Is it on transform follow? I think it's on transform follow. Let's just dump this onto here a sec. Just see what's on here. Yes, yeah, so it's on the transform follow script. You can tell it to smooth things that are, are being followed around. Um, and so I did that YouTube video of the uh, the head menu uh, following the headset around, and I used the transform follow and whacked up the smoothing really high on it. So it, it had this kind of like smooth track into you. So yeah, you can you can do smoothing with that sort of stuff. Um, what was the next thing? Can you change the layout of generated objects? What do you mean by generated objects? What what type? You mean an interactable object? Hands. How to change the controller into hands that move? Uh, load up the example scene. Custom controller model thirty two. Um, and just get the hands out of here. You see, all I've all I've done here to get the hands to work is I've turned off the ones in Steam VR. So model is unticked and model is unticked. So the Steam VR ones won't show. And then I've just dragged the prefab of the basic hand to be a child of the right controller and one of the left controller. And when you start it, all the magic happens. And oh, there you go. You can see the hand there. And then we get a hand. Ooh, hello. So we can just do that. I don't know what you mean by auto gen object, so what what object? Like, yeah, you can change layers of objects in Unity. I don't know what that's got to do with VRTK. Can you ch you mean can you change the layers of the hand colliders? Well, you can do, but that's going to create some issues for you, um, unless you go further down and then start setting them up to ignore other things. Because the hand colliders are set to the default uh, to the ignore right ignore right cast layer to stop uh, right casts from hitting them. So if you were to change them uh, to another layer, which you, you can totally do. Um, you then have to make sure everything is set up to ignore that layer for the right cast as well. So any VRTK uh, thing that's cast in a right cast, such as a point or anything, you'd have to then use a custom right cast script to then tell it to ignore that layer as well. Um, so if you look here, camera rig controller. See, these are on the ignore right cast layer. So if you put this on any other layer, that's fine. You can do that. But then a pointer is set up to ignore the ignore right cast layer um, and because these are no longer on that layer the point is going to hit your collider on your on your controller which is probably not what you want so what you then have to do um, uh, right controller let's add a pointer in um, Point renderer. So here, what generates the raycast? You then have to create a custom raycast object, and then you'd have to say what layers you want this raycast to now ignore, because by default it's set to ignore raycast. But you've now set your collider onto a different raycast, um, and because of that. You'll have to then say, well, we also want to ignore that other layer and then tell our pointer to ignore that layer and everything else that uses right casts for the body physics, the heart, just all that, you have to tell it up. Have I received knuckle controllers yet? I have. Uh, hang on a sec, I'll go back to that example sheen, sheen, scene and show you with the knuckle controllers. Uh, just turn my normal controller off and find my knuckle controllers. Um, 
Actually, this is a cool demo. Let me turn that controller back on because I found my left knuckle controller. So, let's see if this works. No, my knuckle controller's not syncing or not. Hang on. So, I need to pair it. I might need to pair it. Hang on a sec. Let me pair my controller. I don't see the button. Of course it is. Can I find it? There we go. Right. Right, so, if we run this scene now, the knuckle controllers take forever to calibrate, so just ignore the, the calibration step for the moment. Why isn't it working? Oh, God. Hang on, let me just recalibrate these. Try again. How oh, annoying the calibration. It'll kick it in a minute. Come on, you stupid things. Yeah, there we go. No, it calibrated one finger and lost the other finger. I have so much trouble with knuckle controllers. So you can see, right, it's calibrated now. So you can see, same hand, I've loaded up the same thing and it knows I'm using this controller and then it automatically just works with knuckles. So, but you can see that a lot of people are going crazy about knuckles saying how great they are and everything, but I know having small hands myself and actually trying this out with other people with small hands, they don't work very well if you've got small hands. They don't, your, cent, your fingers don't touch the centers properly. So trying to do this, for instance, I'm trying to actually do like sign of the beast here. It just doesn't work because it's, it thinks my, fin my other finger's touching and it's not. And I've seen this with a lot of people with small hands. Um... They just don't register the fingers correctly. And they're really bad at calibrating. But yeah, the knuckles work, as you can see. Um, right, what was the next question? How to use Unity events with pointer on game objects, like use trigger to change colour or other method in script? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, let's do that, that's pretty easy. Yeah, the calibration issues really suck with them. Hopefully, they'll. I mean, I have only got developer uh, hardware for it, and I'm sure they're doing a lot of work on them over at Valve, and uh, they'll improve it a lot. Um, but for me at the moment, they need to they need to do more to the the model. So we were having a play with them last week, and we said even if they just had like finger grooves where you you knew where you to put, because you don't know where the sensors are, so you don't know where to put your fingers. Um, and even if you had just like dedicated grooves where your fingers had to fall into, that would be better. Um, but I have I have so much trouble with with getting them to work, and I know a lot of people, other people with small hands, um, have trouble. So when you see people online using them, they're like, oh, these are brilliant. They think they've probably got big hands. Um, so you know, it it's uh, it's not designed for everybody, unfortunately. Um, okay, right, let's do this one. Uh, so you want to use a pointer on a game object and when you press the trigger to change the colour of it. Okay, that should be easy enough. Let's go back to... Uh, should we go back to the... So let's just do it on the simple pointer. So... Actually, there's two ways of doing it. We can do... Let's do it on the simple pointer. I'll show you why I'm doing it on the simple pointer first. And then we'll do it another way on an interactable object. So if you didn't want an interactable object, you just wanted to change the colour of when you pointed at something, we can do that quite easily. So if we create... Um, uh, we actually want to listen to the, the pointer event on here. So let's create a new game object down here. And we'll create a new script uh, called Colour Changer, for instance. Uh, color changes, spelling like an American, and we'll get rid of all this. Get rid of this. We need to be using VATK. And now, what we want to do here is we we need to know about our destination markers. So we're going to need to know about our left ones and our right ones um, to listen to both events. But I'm just going to set this up on the right one. But you'd need to listen on both of them. So we're going to do public 
VRTK destination marker, uh, and then we'll call it right controller, and then uh, void on enable. We want to do right controller. Uh, would it be destination set? Just see if this works quickly, and then we're just going to take this and we're going to make it on disable as well. So we can unregister our script. Always remember to unregister your scripts. Uh, just going to put debug log turret comments right test. Um, okay, so where's my controller? Oh no, actually, I need to hook that up, don't I? <laughs> I also need to put it on the game object. So hook that up. Uh, why aren't we getting the? Did I not save it? Oh, oh Visual Studio. All right, there we go. Now it's saved. So if we look at that, that should update. Maybe yes, no. In a minute. There we go. And we just hook that up quickly. So hopefully now. Going on here. I think my uh, let me change the activation button for some reason. My um, controller's just messing up all the time. Is this controller even being picked up? Yeah, there we go. He's been picked up, but my, my touchpad's not working. Uh, okay, let's change the activation button to. Trigger press and the touchpad selection button to trigger press as well. Let's see if that works. I had this the other day that my controller just went crazy. No, it's doing it again, it's just gone crazy. Okay, fine. Let's um, come out of this example scene and go back in. Or is this because actually, this because let me just restart SteamVR. It does this sometimes when I sync the. Um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the knuckles. It stops picking up the events, like the knuckles, because I've got too many uh, controllers registered in SteamVR. Uh, so let's reboot the Vive headset quickly. It'll be back soon. Maybe. And then it will tell me that it can't launch because it's already open. Yeah. <laughs> it said it's already open even though it's just launched it. Oh, Steam VR, you are so buggy. Is it coming back? It'll launch itself. There we go, it's launched itself. Right. Let's try it again. I'll change it to trigger press, have on. Yeah, so just needed Steam VR launching. So we're getting the event on in and out, and then if I release. We get the destination event and we've got that test print out. So that's all we need here. I'm just going to take the uh, event off here because I don't want this to actually fire for us. Um, and in here, all we've done, if I take that off now, so when I activate the pointer, the pointer is listening for when it's touching things and it knows what it's touching. And then when we select something with the pointer, we get an event telling us that the destination's been set. And then if we look at this uh, destination, E dot. We've got all these things that are passed into the payload. We've got the position, the rotation, um, the controller reference of the one that's doing it. Oh, I thought you had the transform. You, you do get the transform, don't you? Yeah, we get the we get the target as well, which is actually all one. But we also get the raycast hit information, um, which tells us everything that the raycast has hit at that point. So we can actually get the the specific pin area on the, the target that we've hit. In this regard, we just want target. So if we just do e.target.name, because I believe target's a transform that we get back. Yeah. So it'll tell us the transform of the thing that we hit. So when it loads at some point in the future, we can then point at, let's say, the sphere, and then when we release it, it'll tell us that was the sphere. Then when we point here, it'll tell us that was the person. Hey Fuseman, uh, did you see that Microsoft added Kinect support to SteamVR? I didn't see they added Kinect support to it. I saw that somebody had done some Kinect support stuff. Um, 
but I didn't know it was Microsoft directly. I know that they just had it working with it, but personally, I think if you could get like, imagine if you had like um, the Lighthouse technology for tracking the posi your positional information, and then like connect sensors on the bottom of the lighthouses, and use two of them for like more high fidelity tracking, and then use that for actual tracking of your limbs. How cool would that be in uh, in VR? So you could actually do full body tracking. Like it doesn't even need to be that perfect. I think your hands need to be perfect, and your head uh, needs to be really good. And the lighthouses do that really well. Uh, but if you could just like roughly track the body and roughly track the legs, which Connect's pretty good at doing anyway, you could build some really cool stuff in VR. So I'd love to see that. Like the the lighthouses actually have. Connect technology in them as well. That would be really cool. I don't know how how good it would be because I know Connect needs uh, a certain amount of room to do it scatter and that. Um, okay, so let's just go back to this quickly while you're looking for that article. So you can see we can get that information here um, and we can now just do, do something with that. So we've got the transform so we can just get its renderer and change its colour. So if we do, uh, we know the renderer that we get back is the target. So we can just do e dot target dot get component. Might be get it in children because it might be multiple renderers. Just get the renderer, and we'll store this somewhere. Actually, renderer uh, found renderer equals that, and we'll just then do a check to make sure that it's not null. I love my spelling. Found renderer is not null, then we are going to do found renderer dot uh, material dot color equals, and then we'll just change it to I don't know color dot cyan. That'll do. So now all we need to do is when it eventually loads, when we point at one of these things and release, pew. Don't know what chance she's had. Oh, I know why. Because that's the first. Uh, it finds the, the person, doesn't it? So what we'd probably want to do then is not get the target, but get the one out of the raycast hit. Raycast hit dot um, transform. Because target's the whole thing, isn't it? I think. Because that's just getting the first one out of it. Or do we want the collider? Actually, I think we want the colliders uh, information. I think that'll do the same. Yeah. So we want the out of the raycast. We want the collider. That should do it. I hope. We'll find out. There we go. So that's as easy as it is to point at stuff and just change its colour. Right, what's this? Uh, <laughs> that's that's excellent uh, hacking of the system there, Fuse, man, getting around that. Let me try and regurgitate that back into a, a link now that I can read. Tomshardware.com uh, News. I could have probably just searched for the last part, couldn't I? So is this Microsoft that did this then? Or is this somebody that's just built this? Because I, I, this is what I saw. I saw somebody had, had done this, set up the uh, the full body tracking. Um, but yeah, it effectively just, it fakes... Uh, Tracking pucks, doesn't it? Isn't that what the thing it does? Yeah, I saw this in the week. It's really cool stuff, but... I totally think that if this was kind of like just standard built into the, the, the base stations, and you had two of them working on you, you'd get more information to be able to discern where people's bodies were. It's, it is really cool stuff, this is. But I've thought it for a while. I'm not sure if it is Microsoft, I don't know. I, I do remember seeing this though. It's, uh, what do you need? You need to install the driver for VR. 
So what's this driver for VR? It just says driverforvr.com. And it says I'm, I've got to be for gold members. I'm not a gold member. I don't know what it is, but it is cool. It's very cool stuff what somebody's done. I totally think they need to explore Connect. I think Connect Technology, like, it it seems to have died a death. Like, no one's interested in it anymore, it seems. But it's good technology. Like, Microsoft were onto something with that. Um, Connect One was way better than what the Wii was at the time for tracking. And the games were fun initially. But they just didn't let people experiment with it and find out what worked and what didn't work. Which is like one of the things that I've always said about VR. That's why VRTK is such a big thing. Because I want people to get as many people experimenting and to find out what works and what doesn't work. Because if you look at a technology like Kinect, which is a brilliant bit of technology, Microsoft pretty much closed it off. And then they opened it at the end to like X and A to allow people to build X and A games for it. And then they shut down X and A and, and all that stuff. So there wasn't enough time for people to explore the technology. And to find out cool stuff with it. So ultimately you ended up with a bunch of rubbish sports games, dancing games and mini party games. There was nothing else really ever developed for it. And then Connect 2 came out and they were going to do a big push with it on the Xbox uh, Xbox One. Everyone went mental that you had to have one by default. So they pulled it and again nothing's been done with it. But if they keep go if whatever that technology is is used to keep tracking uh, people, which they are using in a sense of how they're doing their uh, mixed reality headsets, where they're using that inside out tracking. Um, but they needed to do it the other way, they need to have the Kinect track you, because it is good tracking. Yeah, I tell you, tracking, tracking people, like using the, the, uh, the tracking pucks from uh, uh, HCC, I've got three of them, and I don't. I don't think they're all that great for tracking you. They're hard to attach to yourself. They wobble about and they move and everything like that. Um, but if you just had a Kinect sensor or two Kinect sensors and then, as I say, you, you use the data from both of them to really work out where that person is. I mean, the, it might be a processing issue because I know Kinect is fairly processor intensive. But saying that, an Xbox One's processor is pretty old and that could do two. And that could do one. Yeah, but this is the thing. I think Connect slow um, for processing um, because uh, you need a beefy processor to do it. So that it may be the technology is not yet there yet. Or oh, sorry, the, the uh, hardware to, to meet the technology is not there yet. But I think the technology is still very good. The problem with it is it's because it's tracking, um, it's actually using uh, photographic data as well, isn't it? Which is why you, you kind of struggle with the Oculus because it uses webcams to track your position rather than lasers which is why the Steam VR one seems to be a lot nicer because it's not trying to use webcams ultimately but eventually that sort of stuff you'll get better tracking from it so I'm hoping that somebody does continue to push the Kinect stuff because personally I think Kinect was a really good bit of technology and I think if they can take it further <laughs> We'll have some brilliant stuff within VR. And, you know, I know what Microsoft are trying to do with all their mixed reality stuff where, you know, it, it's into that tracking and then wherever you walk, um, it knows what room you're in and everything like that. And that has that has a benefit. But I also think there's a benefit for having a dedicated uh, VR space that you've got to set up. Like, with most of us that have got the vibes now, we're okay with that. We've got our VR space set up. And we know we have to exist in that space. So having really good tracking of that space, I think, is really important. You know, being able to say, right, this is my space, and I know exactly where all my limbs are. Because, like, Connect 2, they said, like, with Connect 2, you could get out to finger tracking. I know when the fingers were being moved and the wrist was being moved and facial features were changing and stuff like that, which I don't know how good it was. It was probably, like, rhetoric from Microsoft because they seemed to have a lot of that with Connect at the time. But, you know, you keep progressing with the technology, it gets better, it gets better, and eventually you are tracking full body. Um, and you don't need to be tracking people's fingers, really. You can have a different tracking solution for that if you want. You can be using gloves or whatever, because you're still going to have trouble with uh, finger tracking, with grabbing and stuff like that. But knowing where your legs are and being able to 
you know, just do like, uh, I don't know, there's just so many possibilities of just sticking a device there without having to hook yourself up with tracking pucks or wearing some clothing or something, which I think are the wrong solutions for it. So hopefully somebody is going to continue this thing with uh, the Kinect stuff. I would like to see it. Um, so I answered your question on the colour and things. Do you want me to show you the other way of doing it as well? Because there is another way of doing it. You could basically have, uh, if we go to using a grabbed object. So this one's an easy enough one to do it on. So, actually, let's just go straight to the pointer activator to use action one. Uh, da, 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 where is this? Interactive with pointer. So, in this scene here, when you run the scene, the pointer, when it looks at something, let's just move back a bit. When the pointer looks at something and then is released, basically, it activates the use action on the object itself and you can just hook into the the use action script so if we look at the the whirly gig script here um, it's just an interactable object and we have just extended it we're not even using events here. you could totally do this with the event but all we're doing is on start using we can literally just get it um, is it render on the same object I think it is oh no they're not they're on the, the children rubbish come back everything or not <laughs> do it the old-fashioned way then um, I hate that window shake thing. You know, I've lost all my other windows. Uh, wait for a minute while I get all my windows back. There we go. Um, so what we can do now here is uh, on start using, I'm going to have to do this on the, the two child objects. We can just do uh, let's do a for each loop. For each renderer rend in get component in children and that's got to be components in children renderer and all we're going to do is render.material dot color equals color dot cyan again um, and we could do the same thing to stop using if you want but I'm just going to do it and start using so what we're going to do now did that save? yeah so what we're going to do now is uh, when we call the start using action um, if I just move out the one. When we call the start user, as you see, I've already done that one. It just calls that bit of code for us. So there's two ways of doing it. You can use the destination set on any object because uh, the point will know what object it's it's touched, or you can make an object interactable and then access it otherwise. And that could be useful as well. So, for instance, if I actually want to touch the controller without the um, the pointer and still do it, I can still do that here. So if I touch one of these, if I move back and touch it it still calls that, uh, that use function and you could use the event to do that rather than override if you wanted to. What you're saying, the, uh, the connect messes up tracking. You see, I, I find the connect tracking, like I've got a connect one on an Xbox 360 and whilst it is a little bit fiddly and flaky, I think still most of the time it works most of the time. And that's what I mean. Like, I don't think Kinect technology is great to track um, a head and a hand that you need. I think in VR, having your head in your hand high fidelity is really important. But I think your legs and your body, I think you can get away with a little bit of leeway in it. You can get away with a little bit of estimation and guesswork with it because you're you know, you're not, you're not doing that much fidelity work with your feet and your body. It's just like roughly where you're ducking, um, being able to work out the inverse kinematics of your character or something. And I think a Kinect is probably good enough for that sort of stuff, especially Kinect 2, or, you know, if they ever make a Kinect 3, because the technology is going to get better the more they improve upon it. Um, I don't know. I just think... There's a good combination of two. I don't think Connect's a good tracking solution for VR, but I think it can add a little bit more onto it. Connect. Uh, <laughs> I need to get a Connect to start with. I mean, I've got a Connect V1 for the Xbox 360, but they're not. Uh, 
they're not PC compatible. I think the Connect 2s for the Xbox Ones you could get working on um, the PC. Um, I wonder how hard it would be to get Connect working with it because all Connect is is just a bunch of points. You know what might be good as well because Connect is very similar to the way um, the Leap Motion stuff works. It just gives you a bunch of points, and the, the technology is different in both of them. But the the out the what it returns to you is relatively similar. It gives you uh, kind of like points in space to track. Um, so I wonder if there's something there where. It, like, because we've always been looking at that as well of like the RTK supporting leap motion for stuff, primarily for hand tracking. But I wonder if there's somewhere where we can just get it like it's doing dot tracking, and then any because then anything that's doing that level of dot tracking in the future can just have like some sort of abstraction layer. So that that'd be where I'd probably see it working. It's, it's totally not on the roadmap for now. There's like a lot more basic things to do still, but it'd be cool to do it. Or if somebody else wanted to do it, totally go nuts. Anyone's allowed to build whatever they like and submit it back. Now it's it's not so hard of getting it to work. What what more the the uh, the challenge is how to make it generic. So getting things working is not overly difficult sometimes because you can just hack stuff together and get it to work. The challenge comes and especially with something like VRT which is the talkies. How do you make things generic enough that you've not pushed yourself down a dead end alley? And um, it only supports that then. So if you look at VRT when it first came out, it was largely hooked into Steam VR. So you had to use Steam VR. Everything had to go on the camera rig, and it was really bad. And there was a lot of lessons learned from there. And obviously, when we move forward now, what we try and do is we try to take all that legacy out and make it so um, the more things are more generic, so you can apply things. So when we're looking at doing those button action stuff or the input action things. Um, and if and when we ever get around to doing that, or if Unity do it for us, and um, and get their input system working, what it means is you can then have like any omnidirectional uh, treadmill just be an input into VRTK. As long as it raises a relevant action, then the touchpad walking script, for instance, would pick up the omnidirectional uh, treadmill as opposed to being uh, a touchpad. Everyone's got the skills today with hacking the system, ain't they? I don't know actually how to give people permission to post links. If somebody knows how to how I give permission, then let me know. <laughs> I can add people as mod writers, but like I just can't I just make it so everyone can post links. I trust you all. Except my Reddit I posted that into that and it didn't work. It's not working for some reason. I give up with it. Reddit's not playing. But I definitely think it's worth exploring things like Connect and that. But the problem is, it's like. You're then stuck with like the existing technology. Microsoft really need to be doing this. It's their tech or licensing out to people. That's why I was ashamed that with when Apple announced the iPhone X, like they've got all the uh, the tracking information into it, um, but it's tracking you. It's not tracking the world. So all their tracking information is in that little bar at the top, but that just tracks you and like what's What's that useful for? For doing animated emojis? Like, what, what was that all about? 
you know, the, the technology, if they'd have put it the other side as well, so you could point your phone at something and get really good um, world data back for AR kit and that, it would have been great, but I don't know. Seem to baffle me that they've they've put it on the wrong side of the phone. Remember for ages when iPhones only had a camera on the back as well, I didn't even have a front facing camera. They've kinda of gone the other way now, they're putting all the tech on the front and not on the back. I'd just prefer to make it so everyone can post links, shoes, man, that'd, that'd help me. <laughs> and people wouldn't have to hack around it. Right, it's 5 2 now. We're probably not going to get any more time for questions. I hope I've answered people's questions today. You'll notice as well now all the videos when they're uh, on. Uh, YouTube, when they get uploaded afterwards, they've got a timestamp of uh, what's been said when, um, which is really useful. Uh, the name escapes me of who's been going through and doing that, but if you're in chat, shout out and say hello. But somebody's been going through all the videos and watching them back and giving me timestamps of what was said when. Um, so thank you very much um, to whoever's been doing that. For the light, I can actually probably find that actually. Um, no, it won't be there. Where, where is it actually? It's in comments, isn't it? Whose comments are these? Oh, it's Altamind Studios who's been doing it. But that's it's somebody in the Slack. It's somebody in the Slack channel, but I can't for the life of me remember who it is. So if you're in here now, um, watching, tell me what you know in the Slack channel because I don't know anybody's YouTube name except for you as well, obviously. Yeah, it's really useful, like just having those timestamps on the videos of just saying what I spoke about at what particular time is really useful because I say to people, Oh, do you want to I spoke about that in the live stream video? But they're all like at least an hour long, so how do you then go through them and you, you know, sit through and watch the lot when you want to find out a specific thing? So it's it's good that they've done that. And I did say like the other month that I'd really like to do, but I ain't got time to watch the video. So for somebody to put the effort in and watch every video and say what I've been working on, it's really cool. So, I just spilled water down myself. So, um, is anybody in chat uh, going to VRDC or coming to the VR uh, TK meetup next week? I know Fuse Man's at VRDC. Are you coming to the uh, the meetup on the Wednesday night, Fuse Man? I think there's about ten of us at the moment, maybe more now. But I think Liv said she was coming, and who else said they were coming? Somebody else said they were coming, so that they'll probably bring a few people as well from like the uh, the San Francisco um, scene. But I don't know how many people are coming because I don't think there's a VRDC thing because a lot of people are coming in late on that night. They're flying in late, so uh, I think we'll be the only hangout on the Wednesday. I guess the silence in chat means nobody else is coming. Should do a world tour. Yeah, on the Wednesday we're all going to meet up at 7pm at the Hilton. Uh, the Union Square Hilton on O'Farrell. Um, so, yeah, we're all going to kind of congregate in the... Uh, the lobby there at 7 p.m. Wait to see who turns up, and then just like figure out where to go, depending on how many people turn up. I was going to book a table at Cheesecake Factory, but they don't let you book tables after in peak times, apparently. So, and then somebody suggested there's some food court down the road. You're not going to make the journey from Mexico. Pfft, I'm making the journey from the UK. But to be fair, I'm not paying for it, so I wouldn't be going if it wasn't being paid for for me. So big, big thanks to the uh, the people that are paying. I'm not entirely sure if I can say who it is or not, so I haven't got permission to, to say who is paying. But thank you 
to those people that are making it possible for me to go to the RDC and talk about BRTK. This is what people don't seem to realise. It's like I do a load of events and stuff, but I don't get paid for VRTK. I'm not in the VR business, so there's not a company that pays for me to go. And actually, when I do go and do anything, it actually pay. I have it costs me to do things because not only do I lose time off work, um, but I also then have to pay my own travel fees and everything to get to places. So when I did Unite Europe, I had to have four days off work, so it was four days without pay. Um, I had to pay for my flight to get there, I had to pay for my hotel. So it cost me a lot of money just to do that. So I'd never been able to do VIDC because the flights alone to VIDC was like, uh, what, £2,000? And then hotel, and that. it would have cost me like £3,000, which is what, about $4,000 maybe, um, just to get there. Then on top of that, it's all the time off work as well. So it's unbelievably expensive. And then people go, oh, Use the patron money. Well, first of all, the patron money is not for that. It's a budget for uh, VITK. But secondly, that, that I'd spend all the patron money on that trip alone. Because I'd been invited to uh, Oculus Connect 4 as well. They'd, they'd invited me to go, giving me a complimentary ticket. But obviously uh, not cover the cost of uh, flights and accommodation. And again, it's just something I can't attend. Because I just can't afford to go. Somebody actually suggested in the Slack channel what we should do. And i would be interested to get people's feedback on this. Because, you know, I'm not sure if it's a good idea or not. But to actually do Kickstarters around attending these events. So, rather than, a ha like we had that main Kickstarter before. To, to do a Kickstarter and say, uh, VRTK will attend, or representatives from VRTK will attend um, this main event wherever it may be and then we have a kickstarter to raise funds to go and if we raise the funds to go we'll turn up if we can't raise the funds to go we won't go so what do people think of that as an idea is it a bit cheeky asking for the community to pay for us to go to places or is it cool because if we don't make the money if we do it once and we don't make it then that's cool because like, uh, the people say about the patron do it with the patron but we don't make as near as much cash out the patron to do that stuff as I say just going to Oculus Connect would wipe the patron out pretty much already and then we've got no budget to do anything with yeah actually that was it somebody said GoFundMe instead of Kickstarter yeah so a GoFundMe as opposed to Kickstarter but with GoFundMe though don't you get the money even if you don't make the target because that's the one thing I don't like. I like. That's what I like about Kickstarter is if you don't make the target, no one loses. Now, what I don't want to do is say, right, well, we need four grand to go to this conference in America because things are really expensive to fly. Um, and then we only raise two grand. And then we go, well, we can't go because we still can't afford two grand. But now people have lost 2,000, you know, a collection of people have lost that money. So I've, I've never used GoFundMe. So how does it work? Do you, if you do that, do you, if you don't hit the target, do you get your money back? You should probably look into this stuff. So that's it. That's the like the key thing to it. Like Kickstarter's not really the right place for it, but it's that model of if you don't hit the target, you get the money back. See what I'm aware of with GoFundMe is you don't have deadlines and targets. You just raise, but there would need to be deadlines and targets for this stuff. We'd need to say we've got there's an event coming up. Yeah, we could do it for going to a conference to get a conference budget. Um, but then the problem is, is people are already... People are pledging to go to... Um, oh, people are pledging into Patreon already. But that Patreon budget is people are paying every month. And... Um, that that obviously that budget is there that if we ever need to to spend anything to get VRTK stuff done we can uh, it's not for you know going to conferences and that sort of stuff um, 
but then would people just then randomly pledge into another thing of you know you you will turn up at conferences or not it's something that we need to figure out how can we funding go into conferences because I think it is important but it's extremely difficult to to be able to fund this stuff if they're in the UK and in Europe I don't mind like spending like some of my own money to do these things like I do a lot of stuff in the UK whether it's uh, the VR diversity thing I did down in London or the VR for good stuff that I did up in Manchester you know and again that costs me money and I did the uh, the future artists lab in Manchester as well and whilst I did get paid a small amount it was nowhere near as much as I lost just in so they covered my travel costs and my uh, hotel um, for I was only there two days so it was only one night um, and they paid me uh, for the time that I did there uh, but the amount of money I lost in not working those days highly offset, you know, massively offset that um, So, but I don't mind doing that but when it's like these American conferences and that like there's just no, like a lot of people have been asking if I'm going to Unite Austin and there's just no way in the world I can afford to go to that and it'd be cool to take like a couple of people from the VRTK community to these things as well. So when we were at the Unite Europe one, uh, it was pretty cool because um, I was there, but also uh, Burdecker from uh, the VRTK Slack channel was also there. But that's because we're both in Europe and we all we were able to come. So like two key people from VRTK were at that uh, conference. But it'd be cool to, you know, if we go to a conference, to be able to say from people in the community, you know, we will go together and we will represent VRTK to, to get it more about a community uh, thing rather than a me thing. Because like, I'm doing a lot of the going around and talking about stuff for VRTK at the moment. But I'm, what I really want to do is kind of move it away from this uh, concept that, oh, this is the Stone Foxes, this is the Stone Foxes. It's all, you know, I want it to always be about as many people as possible. Because it is, it's everyone's toolkit, ultimately. And, you know, we need to push that message and get as many people... Uh, kind of spearheading it and and the uh, the be the figureheads of it rather than just me all the time, because it's not fair for all, for everyone to think it's mine when so many other people put work into it. So it's something you need to figure out anyway. A bit of a ramble at the end. Uh, we ran over a little bit, but that's cool. Uh, but I think I am gonna head off now into the sunset, and I will be at VIDC next week. So. Hopefully that will go great, good talk, and anyone that is in San Francisco, I shall see you there. Uh, the usual ramble at the end, if you're not in the Slack channel, come and join the Slack channel at invite.vrtk.io. Um, and there's always people in there chatting, and I'm in there a lot as well, um, when I can drag myself away from the real life. Um, and I will be back next week, and I'll give you the VRDC rundown, and I'll tell you everything that's happened, um, and how it went, and... There's probably not going to be a lot that's happened in VRTK this week because I'm not going to be doing much work on it. Um, tomorrow, I've got like proper work to do anyway. Uh, Tuesday, I'm gonna I've got proper work, and then I need to get ready for Wednesday because I fly out first thing Wednesday morning, fly to Dublin, fly from Dublin to San Francisco, uh, get to San Francisco about three thirty. My plan is to catch the bar from the airport to the hotel. Uh, or to downtown and walk to the hotel. So I'll probably get into the hotel for about five. Quick upstairs, get myself dressed, get myself sorted, get back down to the lobby to meet people to go out and party. So I'm going to be up for like 24 hours just on Wednesday alone. Then I've got to try and get a bit of sleep to get up on the Thursday to go and do my talk at VRDC. Go out for the party in the evening at VRDC. Get, get back, get to bed, get up the next day and then fly home on the Friday. So... There's not going to be a lot that happened in uh, VRTK next week, but there'll be a lot of VRDC talk, I expect. That's enough from me anyway, so I'm going to be going now. So thank you very much, everybody, for watching, and I shall see you all next week. But bye for now.